Uh, good afternoon, church. Good afternoon, church. Um, before I actually go on, I just want to say for um, those of our online worshippers, some of the prayer requests were missed, but um, the elders will gather on later and they will pray about those, so you're not forgotten. Um, yeah, good afternoon. Wow, this is still as scary as it looks. Um, <laughs> it's been a while since I last preached, and there's been a lot of new faces. So just as a little introduction, my name is Tolu. Um, and I am, you might mostly see me behind the camera, so I'm part of the AV team, um, but it's been a while since I've been here, and I'm also part of the youth leading committee. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's nice to see all of you like this from the front and not behind the cameras. Usually I'm an activity preacher, and pretty much what that means is I always try and engage in something while preaching, you know, just keep me, um, keep me from being very nervous because public speaking is not my forte at all. Um, and that's why you see I move a lot. Um, but yeah, that's not all about me. Let's go into the sermon. So the title of our sermon this morning is, this afternoon, is Why Me? A question mark, dot, dot, dot. Why me? The dots represent that there's something more to come after, after that. There's, there's something else that we're going to explore today. And I hope you're ready to, to dive with me into, this, into the study today. Are we? Are we? Oh, gosh. Are we? Thank you. You're a full church, but you sound like it's only two members in here. Um, So we're going to go back, actually, and read the main text that was beautifully read by Heavenly from Mark 15. And I'm going to start from verse 33. But before I go on, actually, let me pray. Eyes bowed and eyes closed. Our kind and most gracious Father, we thank you for bringing us here again. We thank you. The Lord, you're going to use me and hide me behind your cross. And Lord, the words you, you want to speak, Lord, may you speak through me, Lord, and may your Holy Spirit use me to share that word with them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Um, I should say before I go on, actually, that this sermon is speaking to me more than it is speaking to anybody in, this, in, this, in the congregation, so I hope that you guys would learn something as I'm talking to myself, more or less, um, with, with this sermon. So yes, we're going to go back to Mark 15, from verse 33 to 34. And it reads, At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Hmm. We see here, Jesus had lived his life. He had been, he had done the miracles, he performed the wonders, and at this point, he had been crucified and had been nailed to the cross for a few hours, actually, I believe. And... He felt deserted by God, and then he felt like the Lord had forsaken him, and he cried out to the Lord, why have you forsaken me? Have you forsaken me? Why me? Before we actually look into the story of Jesus, I want us to look at two characters in the Bible, and we're going to start, um, start with Elijah, and these are two characters who I believe cried to the Lord, why me? Why me, Lord? The first one we're going to look at is Elijah. Can we all turn our Bibles with me to 1 Kings chapter 19? And we're going to read verse 4 and verse 10. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4 and verse 10. And if you don't know, Elijah is one of the prophets in the Bible. And he's one of the few people actually in the Bible who um, didn't die. He was was taken up to heaven. He was quite a a, a uh, faithful prophet. And actually, he's one of my favorite prophets in the Bible. So I'm going to read 1 Kings 19, verse 4 and verse 10. And this is Elijah, um, it's referring to in here. It says, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush and sat under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And then we go on to verse 10, and Elijah is here speaking to the Lord, and he says, and this is Elijah speaking, by the way, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with a sword, and I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too? We see here a man by the name of Elijah who had seen God perform so many signs, so many wonders, so many miracles. We've seen, we've seen this man in, in chapter, chapter 17 when the, there was a drought, which he himself announced. There was a drought, and he went to, to, to the brook led by God where the ravens fed him. 
He found water from the brook. He found uh, manna from, he found food from the ravens, actually. And when the brook dried up and there was no water, the Lord led him from there to the widow at Zarephath. This is that same Elijah that if you go a verse, uh, to, verse to chapter 18, actually, to chapter 18, this is the same Elijah that when Jezebel was killing all the prophets of the Lord, that he was the one that the Lord used to prove that he was the true God. This was the same Elijah that when he said they should bring their sacrifice and he will bring his sacrifice and they will see whose God is true by sending out fire on the sacrifices. This was Elijah who had the confidence to tell them while, when their God wasn't answering that. Maybe you're not praying well enough. Maybe you're not, you're not doing this right because your God doesn't seem to answer. They've been praying for hours and nothing was coming up. And you see them praying and praying and you can see Elijah just taunting them and I can just imagine in my head, he's like, I don't think you're doing that right. I think you need to scar yourselves a little bit more. Maybe your Lord is going to answer right now. I think you need to maybe roll around on the floor and maybe your God is going to answer right now because it doesn't seem like anything is happening and time is ticking. He was that confident in the Lord. This is the same Elijah after so many hours and they, they hadn't, they, nothing had happened. They've been staring at this sacrifice and there had been no fire. This was that same Elijah with confidence who said, you know what, I think it's not really happening. Let me show you what, I can, what my God can do. This was the same Elijah. He said, you know what, this is too easy. If my Lord sends down fire on this, you think there was a glitch in the earth that, you know, some fire some, from somewhere just fell onto the sacrifice and it wasn't really my Lord. He said, bring water and pour water into the sacrifice. He said, no, 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 that water is not, is not, is not plenty enough to prove the power of my God. Bring more water. And they poured the water. And he said, no, no, that's you not enough. Bring more. Soak the sacrifice with water. And we see there that they brought so much water into the sacrifice, and they soaked that sacrifice. And then he says, I, I, th I think that that is, is, is manageable. We can see my Lord's power in here. And we see Elijah in here. He prayed once, just once to the Lord, one time. Not for a few hours, not for, not for a long period of time as the prophet of Baal be prayed. He just prayed once to the Lord. And they said the fire that came down, and this is something that I think we need to understand in here. The fire that came down did not just push the water out the way and burn the sacrifice. He actually soaked, it, it burnt up the water. It literally evaporated the water and the sacrifice. And I also believe the altar as well was in, in, in the right place just because of how, how majestic that fire was. This was Elijah with so much confidence in the Lord. And in here in verse four, he's crying to the Lord, I have had enough. Let me die. I'm no better than my ancestors. He's the one in chapter in verse, verse 10 that is crying out to the Lord saying, Lord, I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. And why was this, we ask? Why was he, why was he crying like this? What was, what was the problem? This was because if you go back to verse 2 of the same chapter 19, Jezebel said, you know, after she'd witnessed Elijah kill all the prophets of Baal because because of that experience with the sacrifice, Jezebel actually went and she sent a messenger to, to Elijah to tell him that, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I do not make your, lives, your life like one of the, the prophets that you killed. She was threatening to kill Elijah. And we see here Elijah was crying out to me, to, to, to the Lord, why me, Lord? Why me? And so many times as Christians in different situations and, you know, sometimes when we are among our friends, especially for our teens, sometimes when we are at our workplace where it seems like everyone is mocking God and mocking Christianity and everything seems to be going wrong and it's almost like, where is God and why has God put us in this situation? Like, why me? It seems like there is, everything wants us to give up. Like there is no hope to, to keep pushing. But I want you guys to stay with me because I believe there is hope. There is hope. So stay with me. We're going to hold on there with Elijah. We're going to move on to the second character in the Bible. And this is a character by the name of Job. And some of us might know Job. Job is, is one of, I feel like, the most, one of the, the most unfortunate characters in the Bible. He, he was a righteous man minding his business. And actually, can we turn with me to Job chapter 10 from verse 1 to 4? And I want you guys to focus mostly on verse 2 and 3. Job chapter 10 from verse 1 to 4. And we see... We see Job in here, he's, so many things has happened in his life and he's crying out to the Lord, Lord, why me? Oh, Lord, why me? Job chapter 10, from verse 1 to 4 says, I loathe my very life, therefore I will give rain to my complaint and speak out bitterness in my, of my soul. I will say to the Lord, do not declare me guilty. Tell me what, my charge, what charges you have against me. Does it please you to oppress the, the, the spawn of, does it please you to oppress me? to spawn the works of your hands while you smile on the plans of the wicked. He's speaking to the Lord in here, in case you don't know. 
It says, does your, do, do you have eyes of flesh? Do you have eyes of humans? Do you see the way mortal sees? We see here that Job had been a, a righteous character his entire life. And for, um, funny enough, I was watching something, and I believe it was Denzel Washington, the, the, the actor Denzel Washington. And he was saying that <clears throat> if the devil is not coming after you, you're doing something wrong. And I was reading the story of Job, and that came, it came more and more in my mind, and it was making me think that because Job was doing something right, that was why the devil was like, this is the man I'm going to attack. And just, just to explain to you, see, Job was not, he didn't, he sort of broke the norm of the Bible, because I'm, somewhere in the Bible, I can't remember exactly where, it said it's much more difficult for, it's much easier for a, for a camel, have you seen the size of a camel, to pass through the needle of an eye than it is for a rich man to get into the gates of heaven. It's much more difficult. I don't know if you've seen a needle before, but even getting a thread through the eye of a needle can be very difficult. And Job, and, and Job here, um, and the Bible here, sorry, is saying that it's much easier for that camel to go through the eye of a needle than for, for a rich man to get through the kingdom of God. But not Job. Job was a rich man, and he was faithful. And, and you can see that he was living a godly life. But, and that is why, when his name was brought up in the heavenly council, Satan came up and he made a made a claim. He said, obviously he's going to be faithful to you. You've, you've given him everything he wanted. You've made him rich. You've made him um, happy. You've made him, you know, live a, live a, a, a good life. You've not, you've, not, you've, not, you've not done anything with his life. You've not allowed me to, to lay my hands in his life. And he said, just give me, just, just allow me to, to touch areas in his life. I won't take his life, just touch areas in his life. And he will definitely go against you. And so... The Lord, Lord said, sure, go ahead, carry on. And we see that within the space of probably a few hours, maybe a few days, the devil turned Job's life upside down. We see that Job was receiving a phone calls from like, like um, phone calls of like death and horror. He received a phone call saying like his family might have had an accident and had crashed and they probably didn't, it didn't seem like they had survived. He received phone calls that maybe a shipment worth about two million pounds was just sunk and they couldn't find it anymore. And this was Job, everything was going wrong. And, and to, to, to crown it all, he became ill himself. Like if he wasn't already ill mentally from the stress of the, of the situation, from everything that was happening there, he physically became ill. Then we go on. And then, and then this, is, this is sort of like the, the, the salt on the wound. His friends and his wife turned their back in, against him and literally said he should curse God and die. They had determined that this was the end of Job. The Lord hates him now. We see, just, just going back again to verse 2, and, and I'm going to just read verse 2, what it says again. It says, I will say to the Lord, do not, do not declare me guilty, but tell me what charges you have against me. Some Bible verses actually say, show me why you contend with me. You see Job, in short, is crying here, why Lord, why me? Why are these things happening to me? We see Elijah, in, as I said earlier, he was crying to the Lord, Lord, why me? Why am I the, the one in this situation? We see as well here for Job. Job is crying, why me? Why am I the one in this situation? Sometimes we, we all feel like that. We want to cry to Lord, Lord, why me? But yeah, stay along with me. Stay with me here. Because we're going to move on to the final character in the name of Jesus. And if we go back again, and I'm just going to read Mark 15 again from verse 33 to 34. Just, just to reiterate um, what was happening in this in this environment here with, with, with God. We see God here is, he's been crucified and he's been on the cross for a while now. He's been on the cross for a good few hours. And now he's, he's crying out. And it says, at, dark, at, at noon, darkness came over the land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We see, Jesus had lived his life the way the Lord wanted him to live it. He had, been, he had performed signs. He had performed miracles. He had performed wonders. He, he had told different parables. He had saved souls. And now the moment arrived for him to, to die for you, for me, for our sins. And you know what? If we go a chapter earlier, that's chapter 14, for, um, verse 36. He actually says in there that, Abba, Father... I'm coming here, let me just see if, yeah, there it is. It says, Abba Father, 
Everything is possible for you. So take this cup from me. Let this cup run over me. Yet not what I will, but your will be done. You see, we see God here is crying to the Lord, Lord, the pain, I know the pain that's about to come, come upon me. And Lord, please, if it's possible, can you take this cup from me? And this is one of the verses that proves and shows that Jesus was really God in a human form because he felt the pain that we feel as human. The pain that we feel when we're in the situations where we don't know what to do, where we're trying to cry out to the Lord, Lord, why me? He felt it, and he was crying out to the Lord, Lord, why me? And I believe, actually, that these tears were not mostly of the physical pain he was about to be, that, that he, he was about to feel. But I think it was more of the, the spiritual pain of the, of the disconnection that he was going to have from God. This was Jesus, who had been connected with God from since before time began. But our sins, they were that heavy, they were that much that they disconnected two celestial and spiritual supernatural beings who have always been connected, even when Jesus was in human form. That's how, that's how grave our sins were. To further, to further illustrate to us how, how terrible our sins were, we see here that um, the, the darkness that occurred around this time was an unnatural darkness caused by God. Because if, if you understand what was happening in this period, this happened around Passover. And during Passover, it's usually on a full moon here. And so just, just stay with me here. There are, there are claims that it could have been a solar eclipse, but God literally disapproved that. Because during a full moon, you have the moon, you have the sun, and then you have the earth. The sun needs to reflect all its light on the moon so that we can see the full moon. So when you see like a half moon, it's like, Parts part of the sun is reflecting on the light or reflecting on the moon. And that's why we can see, the, see the, um, the moon in that crescent shape. But at this point, the sun was reflecting fully on the moon and the earth was here. So for a solar eclipse to have occurred, the sun would need to be here, the moon would need to be in front of it, and then you have the earth, right? But in here, it was impossible for the sun to move within the space of less than 24 hours. It will probably take weeks, if not months, for it to get to a, to a solar eclipse from a full moon um, position. And we see here that the Lord literally had to show that our sins were so grave that they caused an unnatural darkness, and that darkness disconnected Jesus from God. And this is why Jesus was crying, Lord, why have you forsaken me? I feel like I'm in this alone. To further show how bad our sins were, the word used for forsaken here was the word by M called, in, 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 in Hebrew, called ekatalipo, I believe, yes, that's, that's how you pronounce it. And this, this word literally means to, to totally abandon somebody. So it's like someone that you do not like is in that room and you want to be on the other side of the world to them. You don't want to be next to them. That was what, what the word that was used in here. This, is, this, is, this was worse than when Job's friend and his wife actually like abandoned, abandoned him and turned their backs towards him, asking him to curse God and die. We see here that this, this forsakenness is the same forsakenness that was referred in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse, come if I can open it, 2 Corinthians from chapter 4, um, from verse 8 to 9, where it says in there, it says, we are we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. It's to show you that being forsaken by God is a truly, truly terrible thing. And that was what Jesus was trying to avoid for us in here. Then, then this is the same forsakenness that was being referred to in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, when it says that, uh, when Paul was saying that at his first defense, nobody was with him, everyone deserted him. This was the forsakenness that Jesus felt here so that you and I might be saved, so you and I might be, might, wouldn't experience God's forsakenness. Why me, these people cried, Elijah, Job, and Jesus. Why me, they cried. But, but why, why them? You know, just, just for a moment, why, why, was, they, why was it them? Why were, the, were they the ones put in this situation? And Looking at the story of Job, I, I, it sort of gave me more clarity on why, you know, it had to be, or why it was Job and also why it was them. Because we see that what happened is that there was a heavenly council where the angels, Satan included, and the Lord gathered. 
And while they were talking, it didn't even say that Satan brought up Job's name. It was actually the Lord himself. So if you wanted to say in some, in some instance, it was sort of the Lord who, who sort of caused this on Job. Because he was saying, they were all talking, and Jesus was like, have you considered my servant Job? He took so much pride in Job that, listen, he told, he told the devil, have you seen my servant Job? He's faithful and he's righteous to me. And I want to ask you guys this, this afternoon, can the Lord say in the heavenly council, has he considered, uh, have you considered my servant and your name there? Have you considered my servant, Tolu? Have you considered my servant, Jaden? Have you considered my servant, Sean? Can the Lord say that? Can the Lord say, have you considered my servant, Ajoa? Can he say that? Can he say, have you considered my servant, Adrian, with the way you're living your life right now? Just put your name in there. Do you think in the heavenly council, can the Lord say, has he, have you considered my servant, you? Because, because the way they were living their life was, was, was in tune with what the Lord wanted them to do. And that's why he was, he had so much, he was so proud when he had to bring up his name. Like, listen, have you seen my servant, Job? But, but why did the Lord take so much pride in them? Why, why was he so, why, why did he take so much pride in them? Because we see here that they cried to the Lord. They sort of, in a way, complained to the Lord. And that's the thing. We as humans, we are, we are willing to cry and we are willing to complain, Lord, why me? Lord, why me? But this is what makes them different. They cried to the Lord. Yes, they did. But they didn't just stop at crying to the Lord. They took a step forward and they asked the Lord, Lord, please teach me what to do. Teach me what to do. We see, we see um, Job here saying, teach me what to do, Lord, when, every, when literally he could have cursed God and said, God, you're wicked. You just cursed this upon me even though I've been faithful. But they said, no, 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 no. I'm not going to curse the Lord. I'm going to actually step up to the Lord and say to the Lord, Lord, let's have a conversation about this. Show me where I've done wrong and show me what I need to change and what I need to do right instead of causing all these troubles on me. They were willing to say, Lord, teach me. Teach me what to do. We see, we see Elijah say, teach me what to do, because after crying, saying, I am the only one left, he's, he's still, he's still, the Lord spoke to him and told him, go to that mountain, and I will speak to you. And he got up, and he went straight to that mountain. He was willing to be taught, and he was willing to listen. Jesus was willing to say, teach me, Lord, because when he said, take this cup from me, he didn't stop at take this cup from me. He said, yet not my will, but your will be done. Are you willing to say to God, Lord, let your will be done? Are you willing to say, Lord, let your will be done? But you see, uh, teaching is, is a good thing, but like, it's, it's not the end of it yet. <laughs> because, but no, 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 no. See, you can, you can be taught, but still not do. So after, after crying, Lord, why me? After stepping, taking a step forward and saying, Lord, teach me. They didn't stop there, but they said, Lord, use me to do what you want me to do. You see, we see Job here saying, use me to do what you want to do, because he had that whole period where he could have cursed the Lord. But instead, he said, no, Lord, I will continue to gain strength from my conversation with you while I go through this trouble. We see Elijah saying, saying use me to do what you do. When the Lord spoke to him and told him, go and get an apprenticeship by the name of Elisha, he stood up and went straight to get an apprentice by the name of Elijah. We see, we see Jesus say, saying, use me to do what you do when he he himself went and decided that he's going to go and bear that our sins for us. Are you willing to say, Lord, use me? Because all of us, we are very good at crying, Lord, why me? But as soon as we finish crying, Lord, why me? We go and we continue doing our things our own way. We completely abandon that. And then something comes up again. We run back to the Lord. We say, Lord, why me? And then we run away again. We're not willing to spend time with the Lord for the Lord to teach us what to do, for the Lord to use us to do what he wants us to do. And yeah, we see that there's three characters. They were, they were, the Lord took pride in them because they weren't just willing to, to, to say, why me, Lord? They were willing to go a step further to ask the Lord to teach them. And one more step further to ask the Lord to use them. See, God took great pride in them because even when they complained and asked, why me, Lord? They were taking those steps. He asked the Lord to teach them to do what he wants them to do. Ask the Lord to use them to do what he wants to do. And in conclusion, as I invite the praise team up, saying to God, why me? Teach me and use me requires constant surrenderance to him. And this is not a surrenderance that happens once. It's not a surrenderance that happens yearly. It's not a surrenderance that happens every month or a surrenderance that happens weekly, not even daily. It's a surrenderance that happens with each and every moment you're faced with. When we're in the situation that we know the Lord is telling us to do something, are we willing to stand there and say, Lord, I will let you, I will surrender myself to you right now and let you use me? 
Are you willing to say to the Lord, Lord, I know that I don't want to do this and my human, my human self is telling me that I, don't, I shouldn't do this, but Lord, I know you want me to, so I'm going to surrender myself to you and I will let you use me. So as we sing this hymn, I surrender all. Please don't, don't sing this hymn as the closing of this service. And if, you're, if you want to sing this hymn as the closing of this service, I would, actually, I'd, I would actually say that it's best not to sing the hymn at all. But I want you to sing the hymn as a sign that you're willing to commit yourself to constant surrenderance to God. Asking Him, that, why me, Lord? Why am I the one in this situation? But Lord, please still teach me what you want me to do. And not just stop there, but use me to do what you want to do. Thank you.
I pray, I just want to say that I think it's okay to cry to the Lord. It's okay to sort of complain. We see Job, he, he let go of his complaints and he cried to the Lord. But just stopping at crying to the Lord and going back to our ways is not okay. If you're willing, really willing to complain to him, we should be willing to listen to him, to ask him to teach us what to do and to ask him for the strength to do what he wants us to do. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that we've learned right now. We thank you that you've brought us here, Lord. That, Lord, may the rest and the blessings of the Sabbath be ours. Lord, may you teach us what you want us to teach us. Lord, may you use us to do what you want us to use us to do. The reason why you put us in the different situations in life, Lord, may they be accomplished. We ask you, Lord, that as we go home, you grant us journey messages and you bless the food that we're going to have right now. And may the Sabbath be 